Welcome back to the Ringside Boxing Show on the Grueling Tooth Truth Network. I am Dennis Taylor, and today's featured guest, Tricia Morrison, is the widow of former world heavyweight champion Tommy the Duke Morrison, whose boxing career was curtailed when he supposedly tested positive for HIV, the virus, in 1996. Uh, Tommy adamantly maintained that his test was erroneous, that he never was HIV positive, and that is a battle that his wife, Tricia, has fought ever since her husband died in September of 2000, 2013 at the age of 44. Tricia has joined us today along with Dr. Jonas Moses, who is a Ph.D. and an expert rebuttal witness for the estate of Tommy Morrison, which is currently pending in court. Uh, they are going to talk to us uh, today about what they have discovered about Tommy Morrison's death. Tricia, always nice to talk to you. And Dr. Moses, thank you, too, for joining us today. How are you guys? Thank you very much. Very well. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Hey, Tricia, you and I have spoken several times before, uh, but never on the Grueling Truth Sports Network where we have an entirely new audience. So I wanted to kind of step out of your way for a couple of minutes and let you tell people the story of your husband's death, which you've always maintained had nothing at all to do with HIV or AIDS. Um, paint a picture of us, of us for us of, of what happened to Tommy a couple of decades ago when he went to Las Vegas for a fight and what you've discovered since Tommy's death um, and, and also how you've been fighting for him for almost four years now. Yes, uh, Dennis. Well, thank you for following Tommy's story um, because it's clearly not over yet. Um, when Tommy died, he died on September 1, 2013, uh, it was after uh, 21 months of being in an antiseptic shock after a surgeon in Tennessee left 12 foot of surgical gauze in Tommy's chest to rot for one week before I discovered it. So um, that was a pretty grueling time for for him, for, for me, and obviously for his family and fans. Well, when uh, they performed a post-mortem uh, blood um, autopsy on him, uh, it revealed that he never had HIV. And his death certificate actually reads cardiac arrest, septic shock, septicemia, which is from the bacteria caused by the rotting gauze, and uh, multi-organ failure. So that's, that's how Tommy passed away. And uh, so when, uh, when it was uncovered that Tommy did not have HIV, that's when I began my due diligence. And, and where are we today on, on this case, Tricia? Well, uh, where we are today is um, the estate of Tommy Morrison filed a lawsuit against Quest Diagnostics and um, an individual that worked for them called John Hyatt and the Nevada Athletic Commission Dr. Margaret Goodman and Mark Ratner, and it's pending in court, and with the permission of Tommy's attorney, who actually entered his appearance on October 19, 2017, just a, you know a few weeks ago, I can speak on this case by sticking to the facts uncovered in the case since 2014, and I can go through those facts if you would like me to. Um. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to those in, in just a sec. Um, t Tommy's mother, Diana, publicly stated that Tommy had died of AIDS. Um, if no HIV virus was found in his postmortem blood report and the tests he was uh, given don't diagnose AIDS, then you know the, the question is how could he have died of AIDS? And, and that's got to be probably the, the basis of your lawsuit, right? Uh, correct, yeah. Well, um, you know, being a victim's family member, which is what his mother is, his family, and me are, uh, doesn't automatically qualify us as forensic ex experts, yeah. nor skilled detectives or analysts. In fact, it's equivalent of what's called anecdotal evidence, which means we cannot base this case on just personal testimony of family members. There needs to be scientific evidence which is where expert witnesses come into play, Dennis. Okay, and, and Dr. Moses, thanks again for being with us today. And you're going to co correct me right away because uh, you say that people actually do not die of AIDS. No, they don't. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, 
just a little bit about I'm going to respond to that in just a second, just a little bit about my background sure. and, and why yeah, I'm please. an expert witness of the case. I'm a former clinician uh, and surgeon from the United States Army. I was trained in the U.S. Army at the Academy of Health Sciences uh, in both ophthalmology and in uh, cl- and, uh, emergency medicine. Uh, I also spent a number of years in laboratory and clinical laboratory research, uh, notably as a cancer biologist, and wrote a book on cancer in 2007. So uh, I know a little bit about uh, the, the disease processes, uh, and uh, I've also been called in the past, uh, called upon to be an expert witness and or subject matter expert in uh, infectious disease, public health policy, and, and cancer research. So the, to the question, uh, uh, now that I've established just a little bit of background, uh, HIV, a, uh, HIV AIDS, is, uh, when people say uh, someone died of AIDS, <laughs> they don't really understand what they're saying. And, and for the vast majority of people in the world, they don't have a good definition of, of what AIDS is. Uh, even when they say uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, they don't c- connect this is a syndrome, it is not a single disease. And from the CDC, uh, their own website, there are a list of AIDS-defining conditions, including bacterial infections, candidiasis, cervical cancer, cryptococcus, uh, cytomegalovirus, uh, encephalopathy, herpes simplex, Kaposi sarcoma, which is subsequently uh, being called into question, lymphoma, uh, pneumocystis, pneumonia, progressive multifocal encephalopathy, uh, toxoplasmosis. There, in other words, there are a lot of disease processes and conditions that in and of themselves are life-threatening or, or fatal <laughs> and, and don't require any uh, other viral uh, infection uh, to kill the human body. And, and so uh, the, to be clear, uh, AIDS is not a disease. It doesn't kill people. Uh, and uh, the, the, the defining uh, disease processes uh, existed long before anyone ever uh, came up with the term uh, or the virus. Um, uh, do you have any questions about that before we move on? Well, uh, so I guess my next question is 20 years ago, you know, people were – Scientists were still learning quite a bit about AIDS. Talk to us about the tests that were used two decades ago to diagnose Tommy Morrison. Were they were they kind of in the dark ages at that that point? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot that's changed, uh, uh, regardless of uh, regardless of what uh, the uh, medical community may say and and the the scientific uh, community as far as AIDS research is concerned. Uh, the kinds of things for which uh, the, these test kits are seeking, uh, the proteins, uh, the, the antibodies, uh, uh, they're, they're still looking for the same thing. And uh, as far as testing is concerned, um, the, there's been a, a real problem, a disconnect between the identification of a virus, the isolation of the virus, the imaging of the virus, the validation of the testing, and uh, to the point where the test kit manufacturers and the process uh, developers all decline uh, the opportunity to uh, to uh, unequivocally state that these are testing for an infectious process. They are not. These are inferential tests, indirect tests, and they are not identifying an infection, and they say so in so many words in their own uh, inserts. So what do you think so happened? When, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I apologize. No worries. When, go, uh, continue, when Mr. Morrison was tested, uh, he was given a, uh, I, I don't know specifically, uh, uh, I don't have in front of me the test kits that were used at the time. It doesn't really matter. They were testing for uh, either a, a protein gradient or uh, an antibody. And the the fact is that whatever test they were using, they did not do an isolation. What does that mean? Did they draw blood and look at it uh, with an electron micro- microscope and identify uh, actual viral particles? And the answer is no. Did they withdraw any tissues from his body? 
lymph, lymph glands or any other tissues, look at those under an electron microscope and identify viral particles? And the answer is no, even though it is well in, uh, appreciated and known and, and a standard practice in pathology to identify the infectious agent through visualization, through refinement of the, of the infectious agent, isolation and, and visualization. They didn't do any of that. And so they used these inferential tests uh, uh, and uh, based on anecdotal evidence, uh, assigned a, <laughs> a, a, a death sentence, basically. Huh. Well, D Dr. Moses, so, you know, Tommy famously did not, uh, he didn't want to be retested in Nevada, but he didn't want to take these tests again to prove that he didn't have it. Is that because he knew, um, or, or was that an intelligent decision on his part just because these tests were not accurate? You know, he, he I'm, might have... I'm going to defer to Tricia because I was sure. not there. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the whole case was actually filed because when Tommy died, they actually found no HIV virus in his post-mortem blood draw. And that was reported to me by an infectious disease doctor on September 18th, 2013, doing exactly the test that Dr. Moses is talking to us about, um, where they drew the blood, they looked at his actual blood under a, an electron microscope and found no virus. Um, you know, there's other things, Dennis, you know, after also receiving an email from the Vegas 1996 physician's attorney in late 2013, he says also that his... Uh, you know, the physician never diagnosed Tommy with HIV on February 10th. So that's when I began my due diligence as well. You know, I began asking questions about the testing. I went directly to the FDA, CDC, test kit companies, physicians, and labs. You know, you mentioned, you know, he didn't want to be retested. Well, um, he was. He was retested several times, but he was retested with the exact same test that they used in Las Vegas, Yep, which actually yep. they use to this day, which I have found in my due diligence, they don't detect HIV. And then when a clinical lab such as Quest that are part of this lawsuit report to a physician that test, um, that lab report unknowingly to all of us is actually not a diagnosis. And what they're concealing is that within these packet inserts, um, that are in their possession, custody, and control, the, the tests actually will um, detect antibodies to other non-HIV-related conditions. And so, you know, I carried on and on with my due diligence because Tommy did have further testing. Um, the CD4 counts, which are called the T-cell counts, they're also not a diagnosis of AIDS but are purely used for surveillance by the CDC, and that comes from the CDC themselves. And the CDC also say that they don't diagnose. So, you know, Tommy's final um, diagnosis uh, on 2013 was uh, no viral particles, no abnormalities, no budding re retroviruses, which are all the scientific terms, which equal no HIV. So. In that huge press release that everybody always mentions when they blog or they do any media articles is, you know, the uh, press release of after he left Las Vegas where he says, I was just informed I tested positive for the virus. Well, no, Tommy, you didn't know then and you didn't know throughout your whole life that those tests actually did not detect the virus. And that was actually confirmed, uh, Dennis, um, by the judge in 2016. He publicly concluded in court papers that the test Tommy was given never detected the virus. And, you know, with regards to the AIDS-defining diseases that uh, Dr. Moses just mentioned, AIDS, like he said, is not one thing. It's auto, you know, immune disorder syndrome. It's, it's something like that. That's what AIDS stands for. And it's a whole basket full of different uh, diseases. Well, one of the things I had done is I had all those 
diseases that are supposedly AIDS-defining diseases, I had Tommy tested for them, and they're all negative. So no, he did not have Carposi sarcoma. The only people that said he had Carposi sarcoma was the Kansas City Star. It's the media, right? Um, so you know that's that's where we are today. Um, with the Nevada Commission still using those tests, still requiring a boxer to hand them a lab report from Quest, and a lab report does not confirm whether anybody has HIV. So, you know, that's, I'm following on Dr. Moses' speech there, but uh, that is what actually happened to Tommy, is he did get retested by the same tests that do not detect HIV, and also are um, tests that will trigger if you have any other uh, medical conditions um, that will trigger a reaction to those tests that Quest and uh, uh, Dr. Hyatt used in Las Vegas and in fact throughout Tommy's life. So he did have a differential diagnosis of certain medical conditions that are not infectious in the ring that would trigger um, a reaction to the tests he was given, Dennis. Dennis, I would I would point out uh, just in, in, in uh, addressing what uh, Mrs. Morrison has just said that uh, these tests are all known to uh, show positive in dogs, in mice, goats, in cows, and in the platelets of healthy human beings, and as as uh, Tricia mentioned, and in humans with autoimmune disorders that are not contagious in the ring. And uh, so, uh, as I recall, there are 70-plus other uh, cross-reactive uh, uh, disease processes and uh, conditions that will cause these tests to, to show positive. Uh, regardless of what the people who are applying the tests may say, the manufacturers are quite clear uh, in in their in their uh, uh, in inserts, uh, exactly what they're testing and what they're testing exactly is not the virus itself. It's the presence of a protein, uh, the presence of an antibody, the presence of some marker that has been uh, assigned uh, this uh, identity. But the. the <laughs> The, the, the problem is that there's a, 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 a really a, a vicious loop happening here. If you ask the doctors, why did you assign this uh, um, uh, diagnosis? Ah, well, I, I, we drew blood and sent it to the lab, and they did some tests, and the, labs, the tests came back positive. And based on the positive uh, uh, exam and the fact that this person has – has indicated that uh, he or she has had many different uh, sex partners and engaged in a certain, you know, shared needles. When I, uh, I, I just, uh, I made a diagnosis on that basis. Okay. And then you go to the lab and the, and you ask the lab. Uh, so did you tell the doctor that this patient was, uh, you know, uh, unequivocally uh, infected with uh, this virus? And the lab says, no, no, we, we don't do that. We, we run the test and uh, the results come back, we report, uh, so we don't diagnose anything. So no one really in the, in the process, and uh, you can go th from place to place to place, from the doctor to the hospital to the uh, kit manufacturer to the laboratory, uh, and, and no one uh, wants to take responsibility, ultimate responsibility for, for that differential diagnosis of, of uh, HIV AIDS. They all, right, they all point the, to someone else. Right, and, and the people that they pointed to, Dennis, in this case with Tommy, is the Nevada Athletic Commission. They were the ones that delivered a medical diagnosis, and you can clearly see that on ESPN 30 for 30, uh, where they come to the, a promoter that wasn't even licensed for the fight, who really is a third party, and they come to him and they say, I'm sorry, you know, Tommy tested positive for HIV. They can't say that. You know, that they're not medical physicians. The physician wasn't even in attendance anyway to do other testing on him as to why he reacted to that test. So the Nevada Athletic Commission were the ones that kicked Tommy out of boxing along with Quest Diagnostics because they um, produced a lab report 
without saying to the Nevada Commission that that's not a diagnosis, and they all assumed that Tommy had tested positive for a virus that supposedly was infectious in the ring, and so they kicked him out. Tricia, this has been a long, frustrating uphill battle for you, I know, because I've talked to you several times before. Um, what did you think of that ESPN 30 for 30 program, which a, a huge chunk of the, of the country saw, um, and they've apparently been working on since 2013? Yeah, Dennis, I watched it twice, and uh, ESPN actually interviewed me for about two hours and included only about 20 seconds, sadly portraying me as the, the wicked widow, uh, what was intentionally left out was actually damaging. Uh, Tommy, you know, I had mentioned that Tommy had successfully attended drug rehab. He always wanted to do drug rehab. He opened a gym for kids in a poor, high-crime area. They left that out. They also left out his final diagnosis coming back with no HIV. You know, on a positive side, though, after their ESPN um, initial event, they did a, a Q&A, a question and answers uh, that they held after. And Tony Holden actually confirms that Tommy absolutely did not have HIV in 1989. And ESPN also confirmed they found no evidence of that. And they obviously have been doing investigations for four years on, on you know, before bringing it out. And that, uh, in fact, that Tommy's mother had suspicioned which is what she used, that Tommy had AIDS. She didn't have it, actually any evidence. She was just suspicious. So, you know, it, also during, during that ESPN, you know, Tommy had his own plans for his own ashes. He didn't want them to be buried next to his father's ashes. He told me that himself. He, he wanted them placed in boxing glove lockets and given to his closest friends and family members that never deserted him in life or in death, and quite honestly, um, quite frankly, that list is is short. However, I did give some ashes to his favorite aunt, um, but I still have, you know, some of Tommy's ashes to fulfill Tommy's own wishes that he wanted uh, done with his ashes, and uh, and I'll I'll do that. And and he wanted uh, the lockets to be engraved with D W I, and that stands for Deal with it. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, when, when Tommy first got that HIV positive diagnosis, Tricia, he held a press conference to make that announcement. And his assumption at the time, as you alluded to earlier, was that the dia diagnosis must be accurate. You know, these are experts. It was a confusing time for him. And his educated guess, um, which he told me on the show, was that he must have contracted it through unprotected sex or possibly from a dirty needle because he was he was very open about the fact that he had dabbled in drugs. He even went to prison for it for a short time. What changed his mind and convinced him that he wasn't sick? Well, because he got up every morning and he didn't feel sick. The only time he said that he felt sick was when they forced him to take those medications for HIV. Um, and that was the only time, and, and he said that, uh, in fact, he publicly said the side effects of the medication are what people are saying are the symptoms of, uh, mm. of HIV, and he said he didn't feel sick. How could he feel so sick when he felt so good is what he said, but, you know, remember, he's not a, he was not a doctor. He was a boxer. And yep. so he did not have access to the packet inserts. He was never informed by any physician, and this is part of all the depositions that were done in this case. He was never informed face to face that, hey, I'm, you know, this lab report that I'm handing you, by the way, that's not a diagnosis. That's just a lab report from the lab. He was never informed of that. He took that as gospel that, oh my goodness, you know, I failed the test. I must have the virus. Well, that's not the case. When you start to delve into the due diligence, and it's taken, Dennis, it's taken me four years. Remember, I was just like everybody else thinking, oh my God, look at that lab report. He's dying. But then when you look at him, you know, it, it just didn't jive. His, his physical being and uh, the way he acted, the way he ate, drank, worked out, that wasn't somebody that was dying. But when you're consistently being given a lab report, consistently being told by a physician that the test that you've just taken 
tests for the virus, then you know you're confused. You're a boxer. You, you're confused. You know, at the same time, he wasn't stupid. Um, so he, you know, he was told he had HIV. He believed it. But then again, at the same time, he felt so good. How could he be dying? Now, here's an interesting part about your story with him. You actually met Tommy Morrison after the diagnosis, and if you were going to invest in a relationship with him, you obviously had to decide whether you believed he was HIV negative, you know, because you're going to be sleeping with the guy. Uh, what convinced you beyond any doubt that he was clean? Well, you know, you you you, you kind of have a feeling for it. Um, in fact, um, you know, when I did meet him, I did get phone calls from ex-girlfriends, and one in particular, which I won't mention, she called me and, and she said, oh, you know, he's got HIV, which, first of all, is something that you don't do. You know, it's like an ESPN, you know, no ex-wife should, should be there handing out, you know, Tommy's lab reports. First of all, I didn't sign a release that she could do that. You know, and in Tommy's absence, you know, you, you just can't do that. I'm the one that has to sign, you know, release. And ESPN should know that. Um, and I flat out asked her, well, you know, if he's got HIV, then, then you must have it. And so she paused and she said, no, I don't. Mm. So I went from there. This is the Ringside Boxing Show from Monterey, California. I'm Dennis Taylor. We are talking to Dr. Jonas Moses. And uh, Trisha Morrison. Trisha is the widow of Tommy the Duke Morrison. Um, so 21 years ago, when Tommy was diagnosed, uh, HIV really had even a much worse stigma than it has today. Uh, Tommy was on the Ringside Boxing Show a few years ago and told us the whole story of the immediate aftermath of that press conference he had when he announced that he uh, had been diagnosed. Um, afterward, he got into his truck and he drove back to, to Jay, Oklahoma, which is a very small, conservative town where he had grown up, and he was a local legend. And uh, as he drove down the main street of that town, nobody in town would even make eye contact with him. And all those friends and neighbors he had known all his life wouldn't even look at him. Um, and there were signs in town that said, Home of Tommy Morrison, heavyweight champion of the world. Um, you, you and Tommy were not together at that time, but you can certainly talk better than anybody else about the kind of emotional impact the HIV diagnosis had on your husband over those years. He, he had lost his boxing career. He had been abandoned, as you said, by lifelong friends and probably family members. Um, he lost that boxing gym that he had um, where he was trying to keep kids off the mean streets of Omaha. Um, people in a really macho world of professional boxing were looking at him sideways. How did, how did you two deal with all that? How did you make your, your own relationship work um, through all that uh, that angst. Yeah, it was it was very sad when I met uh, Tommy. He was extremely depressed. Um, the years that I spent with Tommy, he he just wanted a normal life. He he wanted somebody to listen to him. He didn't want somebody to to catch the next flight out and and desert him and and block him. And he he wanted to talk about it and. He would, all, you know, always say, you know, even though I'm a boxer, you know, I can chew bubble gum, walk and talk at the same time, Tricia. <laughs> so we used to laugh about that. But certainly HIV and, and the stigma that he, he went through was was very depressing. And, and he told me flat out the reason why he turned to, to drugs was because he had to fill a void in his life. And he writes about that in his book, My Darkest Years. He's he's very honest. He's he's very articulate. You get actually get to meet Tommy in there if you've never actually personally met him. And as he says, you know, I couldn't wait to take drugs because then if I'm on drugs for three days, then that means I can sleep for three days. And wow. he would, you know, he would say that people didn't want to shake his hand, didn't want to breathe in front of him at, at one event that he and I went to. This guy walks up to him and says, oh, you know, um, I think I can shake your hand now, uh, but please don't sneeze in front of me. And, you know, he looked at me and he rolled his eyes. <laughs> but, you know, going back to that sign in Jay, this is something else that ESPN didn't mention. You know, there's, there's some really good people in Jay. You know, one of them I'll mention, his name is Jeremy Black and, uh, and the school of Jay. They turned things around. 
and they actually um, put together with the American Boxing Association um, a mini statue, a bust of Tommy there at the school to celebrate him. So, you know, people are trying to make amends for what happened in those days, which is nice, but, you know, obviously he's not here to see that. But certainly the stigma was just overwhelming. And every day, you know, he would he would mention stuff and it was like, wow, you know, how can somebody still be alive and go through what he did? Dr. Moses, have you seen... seen... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, I'm please. sorry. <laughs> I, I don't want to step on your question. I did want to point out uh, before our time is up that... Um, what I find, I think, what anyone who is concerned about <clears throat> infectious disease finds mo- most disturbing is <clears throat> this question of if these tests that are being used are not uh, unequivocally diagnosing the, the, the presence of infection, rather are only inferential tests. Let's go back to the, to the drawing board and, and identify uh, direct ways of uh, of, identi- uh, of you know demonstrating the the presence of the virus, so mm-hmm. we're treating the right people, and we're giving we're we're applying the right uh, standard of care. This came up in the in in uh, cross examination when I was speaking uh, as an expert witness, and uh, they brought up well uh, you know isn't all all of this uh, wasn't everything that these people were doing the standard of care in treating uh, Tommy Morrison. And at the time, I, and I, I acknowledged, well, there is a standard of care that you have to address. What I didn't point out for them uh, and uh, is a fact is that at the time that he was first diagnosed and uh, uh, the treatment applied was prior to 2004. And in 2004 is the first mention of a new standard of care, but not necessarily the only standard of care, and that's the New England Journal of Medicine from 2004. And it really is not until 2007 or 2008 that scientific uh, medical science articles actually address what that standard of care is. So uh, uh, 10 years later, after the fact, uh, so at the time, there was not this quote-unquote standard of care. What's, what's important, the takeaway is we've got to go back and identify ways of, of directly diagnosing the presence of this virus and the infection. So we, we have to turn away from these inferential test kits, from these indirect approaches, and come up with really good science here to treat the people who are infected. Isn't that the most important thing, to help the people who need the help? It is, and it sounds like it's a tough fight right now. Well, first we have to identify, we have to isolate the virus in these folks and, 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 and treat the people who are infected so that we're not uh, inadvertently treating people who are not infected and, and, and hurting them in the process. Yeah. And I apologize, Dennis, you had a, quick, you had a question for me? You, you answered it, uh, you, you actually answered that question for me. Okay. Um, right. so, Tr- Tricia, ha- have you been able to get any satisfaction at all so far on Tommy's behalf through the legal system? Well, the lawsuit is uh, is still pending, and uh, so, you know, that, that to me hopefully will be legal satisfaction. And I think that, you know, this case is all about Tommy and, and what Tommy went through. It's not about anybody else, and uh, it's, it's about the tests that he was given, how he was treated in, in Nevada in 1996, and then, of course, they opened up all the other testing that they did on him, and uh, it just shows that they did the same tests that they did in Vegas, which don't detect the virus. The important thing is is that uh, what they actually left out in this case, which I have continually mentioned to the judges, is that the post-mortem is the test where they actually went into the blood and they found no virus. So all all the physicians actually that are part of this lawsuit are are not defendants in any way. They're not named as as defendants, but um, they are part of what happened to Tommy. And perhaps they themselves should do the research that I've been doing as just a regular person by looking at the science journals, by asking the FDA and CDC and the test kit companies, wait, before I order this test that just says HIV on it, 
what is it testing for? You know, when the when the report comes back and it says react, reactive or positive, does that mean it tests for the virus? And they're going to have to come back and say, no, it does not test for the virus. You need to test poor Tommy for other ailments that he possibly has, which he did have. You know, and those other ailments were normal ailments that other people have that are not contagious in the ring. And that's something that was not done. You know what? The, the actual to, scientific yeah. way to find out if somebody is actually infected with a virus is through the process called isolation and purification of the virus, and and then uh, imaging the viral particles using an electron microscope. That's that is the the uh, the absolute uh, you know uh, unequivocal means of identifying infection. In this right, moment. and that's what they and that's what they did, Dr. Moses. They did that in 2012. They drew his blood, sent it to Boston, Massachusetts. It also came back with no abnormalities, no viral particles. They did the same again in Omaha, Nebraska. They drew his blood uh, the night Tommy died. They asked me if they want, if I wanted an autopsy, and I said, Yeah, I want a blood autopsy because this is all about his blood that he has the virus in his blood. And I, I just want you guys to tell me whether he had the virus or not. So I am going directly to physicians, infectious disease, pathologists. I'm not, I'm not going to the media to get my answers. And unfortunately, boom, the next day after Tommy passed, the media just went into a frenzy, said he died of AIDS because he was diagnosed with HIV in 1996. Well, that's not the case. He was never actually ever diagnosed with HIV on February 10th, 1996 with those tests. So September 18th when I got the pathology report which clearly says no abnormalities, no budding retroviruses which is the scientific term for no HIV, I was told by an infectious disease person in writing with a pathology signing off that there was no HIV in Tommy Morrison. Wow, this is the Ringside Boxing Show on uh, the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm Dennis Taylor. We're talking to Tricia Morrison, who is the widow of Tommy the Duke Morrison and Dr. Jonas uh, Moses. Tricia, you, you just mentioned a few minutes ago you described yourself as, a, as an average person, and you really are. Uh, when you and I were communicating uh, about this interview last night, uh, you were still at work, and it was very, very late where you were. Um, and... Uh, you know, it, it occurs to me to, that it costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time to sue somebody for four years. Um, have you had some angels step forward? How, how have you been able to pull this off and, and hang with this? I know it was kind of a deathbed vow to your husband, and you're dedicated, but it, nevertheless, you know, uh, has it drained, drained your bank account trying to pull this off? <laughs> Um, well, you know, when somebody says, I fought for my fans, will they fight for me? Yeah. And they ask me to fulfill that, then I do. Um, you know, money, yeah, money's important, but, um, you know, I've, I've been doing all the work myself for the past four years. Yep. The angels would actually be the FDA, the CDC, the test kit companies, um, the labs themselves which it doesn't cost much to, to send an email to, to find out, you know, verification of tests and stuff like that. So, yeah, every penny that I have, you know, is clearly going to this, but, you know, it's worth it. Um, you know, and, and when we win this case, which we will, um, you know, there will be a lot of money. It'll go to the estate of, of Tommy Morrison and, you know, believe it or not, his children are listed on that estate and mm -hmm. there's nothing more that, you know, that Tommy would want than that money to go to his kids. So Tommy wrote two books and was working on a third uh, at the time he passed away. The first one was called Tommy, 51-3-1, 44 Knockouts and Still Punching My Professional Boxing Career. All proceeds from that book go to his son Trey. Um, who was a uh, heavyweight, a pre professional heavyweight boxer, and he's undefeated. Um, his second book uh, is called Tommy, 1996 to 2006, My Darkest Years. Proceeds from that one go to his son, Kenzie, who's a heavyweight boxer and undefeated. Um, 
And uh, both of those books can be purchased at TommyTheDukeMorrison.com. They're $22.58. Um, Tricia, he was working on the third one, uh, Tommy, My Unfinished Business, 2006 to 2013. And you've continued to work on that one since his death. Um, and as you just mentioned, one of the things he asked in that book, he says, I fought for my fans. Will they fight for me? What's the status of that book? Okay, yeah. Um, well, there, there are just two more dots to connect, and and then I can get the book to the publishers for them to put out. I I haven't actually gone out there and and done any radio shows solely on his books. I haven't had the time to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, the profits of his books do go to his children when I sell them. I'm, you know, I know you guys have brought out great books and and you've got help to to get, you know, the advertising and sales out there. I haven't gone that far yet. Maybe, you know, a producer will step up and say, hey, you know, let's do this. Um, But those books, the contents of those books, Dennis, um, are Tommy's words and how he, you know, lived and breathed his life from his boxing career to his darkest years, to my unfinished business. These are all titles. And it's funny because it starts with Tommy and it's my boxing career, my darkest years, my unfinished business. And we always used to laugh because everything was my, my, my. <laughs> and until we met and I said, hey, you know, there's, there's more people in this world other than you. Um, so that those words were um, are going to be used in, in an upcoming movie. That's what I was just going to get to, too. Tommy Morrison had a record of 48 wins, three losses and a draw. He knocked out 42 of the, the 48 people that he beat. Uh, he beat George Foreman. That was a world title fight. Uh, Carl the Truth Williams, Pinklin Thomas, uh, James Quick Tillis, Razor Ruddock. That's a pretty good lineup. Um, as a champ and a contender, Tommy Morrison was legit. And, I, and tell us a little bit about the, the movie project that's apparently in development right now. Sure, yeah. Um, well, it's it's going to be the official Tommy movie, and uh, it's, it's endorsed by the um, estate of Tommy Morrison, and the movie script is being written, and uh, we are in development. I can't mention any of the names of, of the people that are involved in this at this time, but the Tommy movie um, will be his own movie. It will be on his life. It will be as Tommy wanted it the way he felt and lived it. Not the way everybody else did, but the way he felt and lived it. Um, Dr. Jonas, uh, Morris, Moses, a- any final points that, that we've, we've left out so far that ought to be addressed? The, uh, well, I think that uh, you can't say this often enough. It's incredibly important that uh, people understand if they have been diagnosed with a disease, but it doesn't matter what the disease process, you want to make darn certain that it's an unequivocal diagnosis. In my own life, I've had friends in college, in graduate school, in my, uh, in my professional career, who were diagnosed uh, as having uh, the HIV AIDS uh, uh, syndrome, and uh, some of them uh, literally uh, out thereafter, were, their lives were ruined. Uh, uh, emotionally, physically, and some decided uh, after testing positive, uh, using these these test kits, to jump out of windows, literally. Uh, Two of my friends committed suicide over this, not realizing that they were not being handed a death sentence. And so it's so so incredibly irresponsible uh, to not do the due diligence of of actually isolating the, the infectious agent and treating those cases that are real cases of infection. Tricia, always wonderful to talk to you. Uh, we wish you all the best with this crusade and uh, ho- hope you find justice in this. Um, and wish you the best of luck with the Tommy Morrison movie and the new book. And uh, once again, people can find Tommy Morrison's book at TommyTheDukeMorrison.com. Uh, we're always glad to give you a platform here on the Ringside Boxing Show, Tricia. And thanks for joining us today. Uh, also, Dr. Jonas Morrison, we appreciate you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Yes, yeah. thanks, Dennis. And we will keep you posted. And 
once again, as Tommy always used to say, he loved his true fans. And there are certainly a lot of good fans out there that are fighting for Tommy to this day. And uh, I know he really appreciates that, and so do I. Thank you so much. Very welcome. Uh, that's going to do it for today's Ringside Boxing Show. Thanks, as always, to our expert analyst, Travis Hartman, Rizwan Zahid, John J. Responti, our British correspondent, Paul McLaughlin, and our featured guest today, Tricia Morrison, widow of Tommy the Duke Morrison and Dr. Jonas Moses. Um, hey, do you like this show? Do us a solid. Tell another boxing fan about us. Bang something out on social media, Ringside Nation. Help us grow. And be sure to check out the number one website, in the world for boxing news ringsideboxingshow.com we update it 365 days a year with the most important and most interesting stories of the day if you haven't discovered it yet you got something to add to your bucket list ringsideboxingshow.com finally a big thanks to you our worldwide audience for joining us again today you are appreciated ringside nation i'm dennis taylor we will talk to you again next week on the ringside boxing show <laughs>